And now, the Lafayette Food Junkie Show, served up medium rare every Sunday night. Welcome to the Lafayette Food Junkie Show on News Talk 96.5 KPEL. I'm your host, Tiffany Deku. Here we talk about all the food happenings around Acadiana. If you like food, tune in. You might learn something new. Uh, wonderful, jam-packed festival weekend. October is the start of fall festivals. And I am not even kidding you when I tell you that there is something going on every single weekend right now. Uh, I just got back today from judging the world championship gumbo cook-off in new iberia i can't believe i've never been before this year because i had so much fun so that so it's two days and day one uh all the gumbo teams cook whatever they want and which pretty much means anything and in an egg roll uh they had boudin egg rolls they had philly cheesesteak egg rolls uh i i saw other versions of egg rolls out there. Uh, and it, w- it was pretty good. Uh, we also got a deer sausage jambalaya. There was fried shrimp. There was every Cajun delight you can imagine that you could get. Um, and then today, we could not have asked for more gorgeous weather. Um, and today was really when everyone jammed Main Street, New Iberia to go down and check it out. And I judged the melange category, which a, a fan of, of the will eat anything. Um, Tiffany will, will do that for you. And it was, it was good. Um, we judged the final six. There was only two that were really questionable. Um, and I don't know if any of you have ever experienced where you, you had something bad and you couldn't get the taste out of your mouth. Um, that would, that happened with one of the gumbos, but for the most part, I took, my three favorites home with me and they were great. And it was a lot of, it wasn't really crazy stuff. It was a lot of rabbit. Um, and then they did Tasso. It was pretty much anything that was not seafood or chicken and sausage related. And joining me tonight as guest co-host is chef Colt Patton. Patton. See, I told you I was going to, I was going to mess it up. I have the hardest time with that last name. Go ahead and correctly say your last name for me. Patton. Patin. Yeah, see, now I can say it. You got it. I'm just going to make you say it every time we, we come back from break. I don't know why I have the hardest time with that last name and Poussin. I can't. That's that's another yeah. one because I always want to say Poisson. It happens to me yeah. all the time. Yeah, and I know because when it, before you when we were walking in, I was like, well, I know it's not Patton. And you were saying that you get yep. it all the time. I get it all the time. All the time. Times. So Patton. Peyton, but it's Pate. Yeah. He is an instructor with Louisiana Culinary Institute, and he is going to be hosting next weekend's festival, Cadian, the culinary side yeah, of the festival. On the table. And we're going to be talking about that a little later in the show. Um, so how many, you run a gumbo cook-off too, because I've, I've judged that one before. That's right. We have a, a nonprofit organization called Heart Strings and Angel Wings. And we host a gumbo cook-off the second Saturday in every March. And we have 30 or 40 entries coming in, and, and you can taste some really good gumbos. And you can, you can kind of get a chance to see how unique everyone's interpretation of gumbo can be at a cook-off. Right. I actually use that gumbo cook-off as an example of some of the interesting things that I've had in a gumbo because that was the one that we had garballs in the right. gumbo. Brandon Como was like, what is this? And I was like, I think it's garballs. That's right. <laughs> Anything in a gumbo. That's right. Yeah. Okay, so um, Friday night, I decided to have a girl's night out with my boyfriend's seven-year-old daughter, and I decided to take her to social. Um, you and I were talking about this before the show. Mm-hmm. Um, social isn't something that I would, I, where I would regularly take children to, but I kind of feel like it's important to, to expand their horizons. A right. Little bit. Which was my whole theory behind it to show them what it's like to eat at a, a nicer restaurant and, you know, expand palates because you're, That's you're right. not going to do it in, unless you try. So we went and I, I, w- I was pretty certain that I was I had made a safe bet because they have pepperoni flatbread, which you just tell a kid it's pizza. It's pizza, and it's they'll, they'll enjoy it. Right. They have fried chicken. They have macaroni and cheese. 
I was like, this is going to be fine. Get to the restaurant. I'm like, okay, so do you want pepperoni pizza? No. Do you want macaroni and cheese? No. Do you want fried chicken? No. Pretty much everything that I was like, oh, she'll eat that. She didn't want. You get to that moment. Oh, oh, gee, what do I do? Panic. So I proceeded to read the entire menu to her and she didn't want anything. So then I really started to panic. I was like, great. This is going to be a really quick trip. Um, I've, I convinced her to get some just French fries. And I was like, look, I said, do you, are you sure you don't want to try the pepperoni pizza? She's like, well, I do like pepperoni. So I was like, okay. So she got that. I got, they have a new fall menu item, the squash salad. I got that. And I went ahead and got the macaroni and cheese because I like the macaroni and cheese. Yeah, you got to you gotta get what you like and say, here you go. Here's something right. very good. Try this. Knowing that, you know, you enjoy it, they're going to they're gonna love it as well. So, and that's what happened. She absolutely loved the macaroni and cheese. She loved the pepperoni flatbread. She liked the french fries. She was like, oh, my God, this is so good. This is my second favorite restaurant. I like it better than Olive Garden. Um, Chick-fil-A is still her number one choice, though. Right. You, you and I were talking about... What's with kids in Olive Garden? I, I don't know. I have I have two boys, and hey, where you guys want to go? Olive Garden. I'm like, well, if it's not raising canes, it's Olive Garden for the for really the boys. raising That's canes. Right. Yeah, for her, it's Chick Fil A, and I really think it's more about the the, the playground, playground than it is the cuisine. Yeah, Chick Fil A. <laughs> but, Between the playground and the ice cream, I don't know what's better. So. Right, so, and we even passed Olive Garden too. She was like Olive Garden. She was, I mean. She was just like, I love Olive Garden. And she said something about the macaroni and cheese. She was asking what kind of sauce was on the macaroni and cheese. And I was like, oh, because she doesn't like, she she said one day she doesn't like white cheese. Mm -hmm. And so I just kind of went, oh, it's a, it's a type of cheddar is what I told her. And she was like, and she said something about, uh, I guess she was comparing it to the Alfredo at Olive Garden. (laughs) I was like, no, this is it's way a little different. better. I also loved, so social serves the macaroni and cheese with the jalapeno mm-hmm. on top. It came to the table and she said, what is that? I do not want that at all. <laughs> I was like, it's a jalapeno. I was like, uh-huh. I don't eat it either. We can just push it to the side. Let's take the- it off and it'll be fine. Right. It'll be okay. I was like, we'll, we'll survive. And she was like, okay. And she loved it. So I think... That it's and and come to find out they had a kids menu too that I could have asked them for, but I don't know. I, me and my mom were kind of gotten a little tiff on Facebook about that. That maybe I should have taken her to a more kid appropriate place. But I feel like if you don't take them to adult places, right. then how do they learn to you act? Have, you have to try, and and the worst case scenario, you get an appetizer, and then you go to. Chick Fil A right after, right, <laughs> which you know. which I thought was going to happen. I was like, we're getting fries here, and we're going to end up yep. at Olive Garden. That's happened to us a couple times. <laughs> really, where we start off at a restaurant, and you know, right after an appetizer, we're paying the bill, and and we're going to stop at McDonald's or Chick Fil A or Raising Cane's or something that those kids will, you know, enjoy. Let me ask you this um, about introducing them to foods that they haven't tried if they're apprehensive to trying it do you still make them try just like a little bite of it because i'm thinking about doing that i I kind of try to word it and convince them hey look let's try it together you know the the five-year-old he's now the age where he wants to help out in the kitchen then we start off with the breakfast you you crack the eggs you stir them we're going to cook them but then i'm chopping onions and bell peppers and he's like oh let me try it and as soon as he tried, he's going to go, yuck. But at least he's tried it. And then you kind of work your way through and trying different things. And, and you know, you never know what they're going to surprise you and really enjoy. I think if they help cook it, a lot of times that convinces them mm-hmm. and they want to try it. So it that's, it a, that's a good idea. I just remembered, too, um, I was like, oh, do you want to try Brussels sprouts? No. <laughs> the biggest eyes. I was like, but they're cooked in bacon grease yeah, they're, they're delicious, amazing but the word brussels sprout yeah. that's you know hey look this is something an alien would eat let's try it and right and let them try and eat it ah that's you a know. good idea too all right we are going to take our first break and when we come back we have more with chef colt so come back to us it's the lafayette food junkie show on news talk 96.5 kpel 
the best tasting radio show in all of South Louisiana. It's the Lafayette Food Junkie Show on News Talk 96.5 KPL. Welcome back to the Lafayette Food Junkie Show on News Talk 96.5 KPL. I'm your host, Tiffany Deku, and joining us as guest co-host tonight is Chef Colt Patam. See, I did it again. Yeah, uh, I'm going to do it the rest of the show just because I'm overthinking it. Uh, he is an instructor at Louisiana Culinary Institute in Baton Rouge, and you are hosting the culinary portion of next weekend's festival, Akati Ann. That's right. Um, it's going to be two days, and I say that Festival Akati Ann is probably my favorite festival besides Festival International because the food is so much a part of the festival, just like the music and the crafts. The music and food is, is what, what can be better. Also, any festival that starts with the cutting of boudin it is right up my alley. Right. Yeah. So, so uh, tell us a little bit about the events that you're going to be hosting. And um, y'all are doing stuff a little different yeah, this year. Yeah, a little different. So I've been doing the, the cooking demonstrations for a couple of years now and, and getting feedback from the guests and kind of what do you guys want a little bit more? And so what we're doing is we're getting some guest chefs coming in and we're picking Cajun and Creole topics. And the chefs, I tell them, don't just come in and cook whatever you want. Let's cook something that's going to mean a little bit more about Cajun and Creole heritage. Putting cayenne pepper on food doesn't make it Cajun. Putting tomatoes in something does not make it Creole. So let's expand the knowledge and give it the respect it deserves. So... I have a, a lot of topics that we're going to be covering over the, those uh, Saturday and Sunday. So we're starting off, I'm going to go with a, a Cajun versus Creole lecture. What does it really mean to be Cajun? What is the, the food ties between Creole? And then we're going to start off for, with boudin. So boudin for breakfast. We're going to make a little boudin slider with some steamed syrup. That's Can't always go a good wrong. way. So yeah. It's going to be delicious. But then we have some other guest chefs coming in. Uh, Michael Schaffetti, which is another instructor from Louisiana Culinary Institute. And he's going to be doing jambalaya versus paella. And we're going to have two pots going on, and we're going to give the history behind it. We're going to cook a little live cooking demonstration. And I'm going to have my minions. So since I'm a chef instructor, uh, all these events, I bring about 10 to 15 of my culinary students so they can learn and network with these chefs and try some really good food and so they're going to be helping out and then later that saturday we're going to have uh, bennett simmons with crawfish town usa coming in and we're going to talk about shrimp and grits what is you know that classic new orleans tradition of shrimp and grits then you can't go wrong with bayou tesh brewery coming in with the beer tasting and i'm going to have a one of my students coming in with a uh, a redfish creole sauce that we're going to use oh, wow their Akadi blend. And so we're going to taste some beer and, and try some really good food. And to finish off that day, we have the guys over at Sweet Crude Rum coming in. And I guess we can't go wrong with bread pudding with a little uh, Bananas Foster's rum sauce to go right on top. So a lot of good food on, the, on that Saturday. And then Sunday, you know, jam-packed with more food, alligator sauce pecan, shrimp. Uh, we're going to have grits and griots, crawfish etouffee, so a, a lot of uh, really good food. We're going to learn a little bit about the history about Cajuns versus Creoles. And then I'll be able to share all of these recipes with all the guests. And we should also say that these little instructing classes are free. Correct. And free samples. you get samples. <laughs> yes. yes. So you show up. There's a, It's a nice little tent. We have a nice cooking stage set up. It's in uh, the the food section yes, of right the festival. Yes, it's right next to the food court. So okay. um, you're going to... You can't, the smells will bring you there. So uh, it's far enough away from the bands where you can still hear them, but you can hear the chefs talking about how to cook and prepare the foods. Okay. Um, talking about Cajun versus Creole, can we get a little sample of what the difference between right. the two is? Because so, I always say tomatoes. Right. But. So what I think about Cajun is, is simplicity. You know, salt, pepper. Yes, you can put a little cayenne pepper granulated garlic, but it's, it's simple. It's your basic smothered in a gravy. If I were to make a beef, you know, smothered steak in a gravy, round steak, salt and pepper, brown it really nicely, uh, classical French cuisine, you know, you take that and, and you go to even further by browning and deglazing, getting that nice reduction and serving that. Where Creoles is going to be a little bit more of a higher end. They're, you know, New Orleans 
uh, you know, the, the gateway, the, the, the food capital, uh, the melting pot of all these cultures and flavors, you get into different herbs, different uh, spices. And so when I think about Creole, yes, tomatoes, but I think about fresh peppers and fresh herbs, the basil, the oregano, uh, bay leaf. And so that's just a little sample of kind of Cajuns versus Creoles. I want to ask your opinion on this. This was something I recently came back from a tour of North Louisiana, Shreveport, Bossier mm-hmm. area. And one of the chefs up there was was talking about, and she had never thought about it either until somebody brought it up to her, that in Cajun Creole cuisine, they don't cook with a lot of fresh vegetables like they do in Southern food Mm -hmm. or in North Louisiana. In North Louisiana, you have a lot of like greens and Mm -hmm. and purple whole peas and and, and, uh, like the the vegetable sides are are almost a a dish, the main dish in themselves. But in Cajun Creole culture, it's more about the the rice and the gravy. It's about the, the main the main protein, that rice and gravy, the you know smothered turkey necks, the backbone stew. You know you're gonna have your corn mock shoe and your smothered green beans, right. your black eyes and and your coleslaw. You know the the sweet potato on the side, but it's not as you know it's not as fresh as it's just you know a nice little squash salad or right uh, things of that nature. Yeah, and I I had never thought about it before until they had said about it, and I was like, huh, that is so, it's kind of true. But then that's, I mean, that's the differentiation between Mm -hmm. Southern and Cajun Creole, too. I live in Bro Bridge, and I work in Baton Rouge, and I try some of the different restaurants here and there. And even though it's, it's you know, 45 minutes away, an hour away, depending on traffic, but the food is totally different. Very much so, Yeah. yeah. It's like you're going, you want to experience something new, and then you go to New Orleans, and then it's a totally different food scene there. You know, when I do competitions, or I, I, I've i got to change the recipes to fit that clientele. And, you know, it's, it's sometimes it's spicier. Look at New Iberia. You know, you've got to load it up with hot sauce, but right next to Avery Allen and Tabasco plant. So, you know, they're going to have their gumbo. Right. And you're going to be able to taste that hot sauce in it. I like that. I think that that is so cool that in one state Mm -hmm. you can go, you can, we'll say gumbo. You can get gumbo so many different ways depending on where you are Mm -hmm. in the state. And I just, I think that that is so fascinating. And I feel like that's something that makes Louisiana unique to other states. Even even with gumbo, the consistency, the the coloration of the roux. I did a a guest chef's presentation a few years ago for a bunch of... um, resort chefs, country club chefs. And I talked about Cajun versus Creole and just about roux. You know, classic French, you have that butter roux, butter and flour. Cajun Creole, we can get into lard or vegetable oil. Um, so you can take that roux a lot darker and really uh, develop those those nutty aromas and those flavors. And if you go to, you know, Creoles, they're going to have a, a almost like a milk chocolate right. brownish roux. Where Cajuns, you'll have that dark chocolate and just the depth of flavor that comes from taking those ingredients a little bit farther. It's, it really makes a, a difference. It's so fascinating. All right. And you talking about festival season are very busy. So you're doing Festival Cotillion next That's weekend. Correct. Then the weekend after that is the Boudin Cook-Off. Boudin Cook-Off. You... So we're going to do something a little different. Yeah. So now that I'm an, I'm an instructor and I'm bringing my minions, I have to show them. We're going to make some traditional Boudin. But uh, we've been experimenting at the school and, and getting the creative juices. So we're bringing in a spinach, artichoke, and sun-dried tomato boudin. Uh, we took some uh, Bayou uh, Raging Cajun as the liquid, and we made boudin beer. So you can't go wrong there. Wow. And then we are experimenting right now with the dark chocolate boudin. And it sounds weird. It's um, it, Sometimes it does taste a little weird, but after the first bite, you're like, man, what is it? And you go for the second bike. It, it's it leaves you it kind of grows more. on you, yeah. Right. And then we're gonna make boudin st- uh, stuff that grows and a few other little things. You know, we love boudin here, and it's one of my favorite items. And me too. And so uh, I can't wait for that weekend. Uh, and then on October twentieth, you're gonna be helping out with the Louisiana Chefs to Watch dinner That's in New right. Orleans. And Chef Ashley Roussel, who was formerly of St. Shreden, is mm-hmm. one of the chefs. And then also Nathan Richard, who 
was from the Thibodeau area, but he was in Lafayette. Uh, he was associated with Cochon Lafayette when All it was right. in town. So uh, he's also one of the chefs doing really cool things with Alligator yep. <laughs> and, and his know, restaurant. I've been helping out ever since 2011, whenever uh, I became a uh, Louisiana cook and chefs to watch. And my role for this year is basically I'm bringing my minions and we're going to help run the front of house service. So we're going to taste some really good food. We're ba- we're going to act as sous chefs for those uh, top chefs and, and really get a chance to work with them. So that way we can help them shine at their moment of, of, of greatness. You know, this is a great opportunity for them. You guys do a fantastic job over there because I've gone to a few events that you guys work the front of the house and y'all help out and y'all will do some of the appetizers right. or you do some of the desserts and y'all do a fantastic job over there. So kudos to Thank you guys. Thank you so much. Well, Louisiana Culinary Institute, we're off of Airline Highway in Baton Rouge. It's a 16-month associate's degree program. And uh, so these students come in. And they get a chance to learn everything they need to know about a restaurant. They're even going to wait tables. We have a front of house instructor, Clark Ellis. I'm like, if I've got to go run front of house, I'm bringing him with me. um, Because he does an amazing job helping to coordinate those students. And and it's a lot of fun. Food, passion, you have to love it. So uh, anything that we can do and get out in the community and help out, we're we're there for it. Uh, I'm the unofficial kind of... Uh, volunteer, little extra coordinator events guy at the school. So, All right, we are going to take another break, and when we come back, we have more with Chef Colt. So come back to us. It's the Lafayette Food Junkie Show on News Talk 96.5 KPL. From Boudin to the best burgers Acadiana has to offer, it's the Lafayette Food Junkie Show on News Talk 96.5 KPL. Welcome back to the Lafayette Food Junkie Show on News Talk 96.5 KPEL. I'm your host, Tiffany Deku, and joining as guest co-host tonight is Chef Colt, who is an instructor at Louisiana Culinary Institute. I also want to thank the caller that just called in on the commercial break. Um, he checked out Real Barbecue in Shreveport and loved it. I'm so excited. Uh, Mr. Clay was an honor to get to interview, and I love that he said that smoke and love make his barbecue so good Perfect. so yeah uh, that's another thing that we always debate about is if we don't have good barbecue in south louisiana but we do have good barbecue yep. in north louisiana right okay so i was asking you before the show with the popularity of top chef anthony bourdain all the culinary mm-hmm. shows going on uh nationally more people are it's are signing up to go to culinary school. Have you found that to be the case? Yes and no. You know, it it kind of fluctuates between the semesters. Uh, Food is passion. And we get a lot of chefs that want to come in and open up their own restaurants and do their own things. And, you know, the our white neckies, our freshmen, as we call them, they'll come in with that Gordon Ramsay aspect, and they're trying to critique really hard. And then when they get into their second semester, they step foot in the kitchen, and it's a very humbling experience. Right. And so, you know, uh, we have a lot of successful graduates out and doing really amazing things with food. And, you know, it starts with passion, a passionate person. And we have a a great staff and faculty at the school. And, you know, we kind of do our thing, our parts, so that we can instill that passion. Like for me, I started a company called Cajun Culinary Roots. And with this company, I've, I've created a seasoning called Cajun Maypalm, an explosion of flavor. The name uh, kind of re- comes back whenever I cook for Andrew Zimmerman, And he was like, man, this is like napalm, an explosion. And so that kind of just stuck with me, having that experience with him, which was an amazing experience. And the recipe took me about 10 years to develop. Wow. And I came across uh, a key ingredient, Worcestershire powder. And so once I incorporated that in the seasoning blend, you know, for me, this it reminds me of my grandmother, you know, cooking salt and pepper and wish this year you know it's it's a really good blend and so through this i'm able to do different events and and share that passion and my journey um as a small little business uh with these students and you know like i still call them my minions they we came out yesterday at the bro bridge crawfish derby and had about 15 students 
and they helped with the judging. They helped with the concession. They cooked the uh, jambalaya mix that I'm developing, and, and they basically ran the, the Cajun maypalm table. And I'm like, I couldn't be so proud. And it was the debut of that product line. And so I sent them a message on Facebook. I was like, thank you for being a part of a, a milestone yeah. uh, of, of my journey. And, and so being able to touch them and really help them grow and, and instill that passion uh, when they're going to finish the program, they're going to go out and do amazing things and really going to ch- change the culinary forefront of our of our Cajun and Creole history. So how many, I think you said you get we, we except, except 35? We accept 35 in our savory program and about 15 in our bacon and pastry program every semester. And we do have a, a it fluctuates with our graduation rate um, depending on if we, if we, like right now, we'll have 30. Uh, five students signed up. I haven't lost anyone yet, which is a good thing. Uh, I have a couple that kind of have their own little restaurant. They're just wanting to take it to the next level. We have a couple of them that want to do food trucks. We have one that wants to be a food writer. And so what we do is uh, we know all of our students by name. And we're a small school. We, uh, we, we keep our numbers low so that we can kind of get a chance to know them and through their journey and help uh, kind of prim- push them in the right direction so that way when they're finishing the program, they're going to go out and, and and become very successful. And we have a few that, you know what, the culinary world's not for me, but they they have a found uh, new foundation and appreciation for the food service. Right, exactly. Uh, there is a, a girl in town that is working in one of the local restaurants and she's going mm-hmm. to school there i'm very much enjoying seeing all her pastry yes. pictures that she's been posting uh which which made me question what you guys do with all the food that right. y'all are cooking during the school day well, well right now i'm finishing up a knife skills class with my 30 students and i have two instructors myself and another instructor we kind of bounce around and throughout the Last week, we did about 400 pounds of potatoes, 200 pounds of carrots, 100 pounds of onion, and a number of different things. And so I've had about eight students last Friday, and we made about 50 to 60 gallons of soup. Uh, we cryovac them, put in the freezer, and then the Baton Rouge Food Bank's going to come and pick it up. So, you know, whatever we can't use in the school, we're going to repurpose it and then give it to the community. You know, during the the little flood, we were able to serve about 36,000 meals to people. And um, I actually had uh, Miss Lisa White, a chef out of New Orleans. She was a chef to watch. She came from New Orleans. She has a Willa Jean's restaurant. Yeah, I was about to say, um, she's with Willa Jean. Yeah. And she drove with about eight pans of jambalaya. Uh, She came to my mom's house. I had recruited about 20 or 30 volunteers. We basically put a couple of tables in my mom's little daycare area. We made a little service line. We made about 200 plate lunches. And then we we had a little convoy of people. And we went to a couple of neighborhoods that were were affected. And so throughout that week, we were able to serve about 1,200 meals just in the Bro Bridge area for people. So it's getting a chance to do great things and, and not all about just making a profit, right? Even though that is good sometimes, but giving back to the community and you know it's uh, being able to touch people through food, and that's one of the reasons why I became a chef is is to touch you know, people and and kind of share my passion with them. When did you decide that you wanted to pursue cooking as a career, and then from there become an instructor? Well, as a younger, when I was a, a little boy watching Food Network and Emerald and, and uh, Justin Wilson and making mud pies and saying, this is what I really <laughs> want to do. And, and just kind of watching the grandmothers and, and uh, my family just around the stove. And, you know, some of the best times I remember it is holidays and Thanksgiving and Christmas and just the lavish food and the feast that we have. And, and so once I did a couple of things outside the food service industry, but uh, it all comes down to getting in that kitchen. And for me, Cooking food, it's it's a it's very fulfilling. But now that I started teaching as an instructor, it's taken that excitement and all to a, a different level. What do you prefer 
you said you prefer being an instructor as to being on the line. What right. if, what exactly about being an instructor is more, well, you know, better suited for, me, for you? For, for me, it's working with those students hands-on and, and, and getting a chance to teach them a skill. You know, I can give them, you know, the little famous quote, you can feed them, uh, bring them fish, and they can eat a meal, teach them the fish, they can feed themselves forever. Right. And so just kind of, you know, I'm, I like to surround myself with passionate people. And in the culinary school world, I've got 30 students that are paying a lot of money to go to school. So, and they're they're committed. They're showing up early. They're staying late. Hey, look, guys, we have this event. We need to come up. We need chefs to help out. We need volunteers for this. And, you know, chefs here in, in, in Lafayette and Acadiana, we kind of all are like that, where we're going to rally together for a great cause. Right. And, and we're going to cook really good food. And, and you know, it's, you can't beat it. What has been one of the highlights of your career so far? For me, 2011 Chefs to Watch winning that award. Yeah. But also cooking for Anthony Bourdain and Andrew Zimmern pretty much uh, about two weeks apart from one another. And and so those are the three, I guess, uh, life-changing, career-changing moves for me. What was it? What was Anthony Bourdain like? Everyone that I've I've talked to that has was around him at that time just says he's a real cool yeah, guy. He was awesome. You know, he, he he came in a little late. He wanted to enjoy a ride a little bit longer. So we kind of um, stayed there a little later to wait on him. But, hey, it's Anthony Bourdain. He'll right. show up when he's ready. And uh, we did the crawfish, and, you know, he, he called me the boil master. And uh, it was it was a great opportunity to, to meet him and just, you know, sit down at the campfire, have a beer, and listen to the stories. You know, and then you can ask him a question, and he's he's going to tell you the, the truth. And, you know, his little stories, and it was an awesome experience. I feel like him coming here and with Toby Rodriguez being, uh, but you know, on the show, mm -hmm. that that helped his career Definitely. so much. I mean, I, I wonder, you know, would the, would the boucheries be happening and everything, the, the culinary explosion that we had in town, would it be happening right now had that episode not come out yeah it kind of it, it gave a respect to our food culture on a national level exactly all right we are going to take another break and when we come back we have more with chef colt so come back to us it's the lafayette food junkie show on news talk 96.5 kpel and now we talk about food it's the lafayette food junkie show on news talk 96.5 kpel Welcome back to the Lafayette Food Junkie Show on News Talk 96.5 KPEL. I'm your host, Tiffany Deku, and joining tonight as guest co-host is Chef Colt. We want to mention really quickly that you guys do... Leisure classes for, for the, the general public. public. Yeah. So it's usually at one Saturday a month. The chef instructors will get together, we'll plan a menu, and the, the guest students will come in, and it's in, it's about $100 to $125. You'll get a custom LCI apron, recipe packet, guided chef instruction you'll leave with enough food for about four days uh it's a great experience we do uh private leisure classes we had um a bridal party come in and do a little bridal oh, wow. uh cooking class and corporate team buildings a lot of fun i also do little wine dinners over at ease kitchen yeah to promote the up-and-coming cookbook uh, which is titled Cajun Culinary Roots, which is very fitting for the company I've just started. Right. Uh, all the recipes that are in the cookbook are going to feature the Cajun May Palm seasoning, which is the explosion of flavor. Uh, so a lot of good things are coming up in the next up and coming weeks. Okay, so cookbook, spice mix, right. jambalaya, uh, jambalaya mix. mix. And, okay, so what makes this jambalaya mix different than other things that are on well, the market? Cajun May Palm seasoning. Um, the Worcestershire powder, I kind of increased the Worcestershire in the jambalaya mix. So that is the the wow factor. It's kind of, what is in there? I don't know, but I have to go back for a third bite. I, I'm trying to figure it out. Fourth bite. After the tenth bite, you're kind of, man, I, it's just good. I'm kind of down with this because, especially my Bloody Marys, I love all the Worcestershire right. sauce. Like, I'm, I almost want to be like, just you know, put that in there and with with the tomato sauce. 
tomato Definitely. sauce, tomato juice. Yep. And, you know, we'll be good. So I'm kind of on you with that. I'm about to ask you a question out of left, left field, but it was something that I was wondering after this weekend. Does jambalaya mix, or if you make it from scratch, mm-hmm. typically have corn in it? No. In, in any form, like corn oil, anything like that? Well, not really. Okay. It all depends on that chef. You know, technically, there really isn't a recipe for jambalaya. Jambalaya was whatever the you had in your left, refrigerator, yeah. refrigerator. You throw it together. You put some medium grain rice in, and you basically cook, and you have a jambalaya. So it's not until the last couple of years that you've seen with restaurants having a, a staple, some a flavor profile. And you have the jambalaya mixes that are coming out. And I was wondering if they had cornstarch or, or typically. In, in, not really. Okay. And so like with my my mix, I want to make sure that it's quick and easy. So in 30 minutes, you can throw something together that is really good quality ingredients. And you're... Okay. Yeah. I was wondering that. And I was like, let me just ask you this since we're talking right. about jambalaya mixes for clarification. Okay, so we have about eight minutes left of the show. Uh, There's some questions that I, quick fire questions that I typically ask the chefs, our first time guests on the show that come on. Uh, Death row meal. My death row meal is beanie weenies. Something I grew up eating because that was the first thing I really could make on my own. Um, Slice weenies, some pork and beans, and sweet baby rays. Uh, barbecue sauce. Yeah, so we're not talking yeah. about opening a can. No. You're make, making you're it still from making scratch, it so from it still scratch. takes you two minutes to make it, but then you have to serve it with a slice of eventually made bread. So Ooh. Uh, at my house, that is a meal that we will have every every now and then because it's quick and easy, and it brings me back to when I was I was little. That's a pretty simple. That's a very simple death row meal. Mm-hmm. I like it. I like it. All right, if if we were going to do a follow-up question to that and be like, okay, so that's the a simplistic one, right. what would be like a fancy, over-the-top, extravagant one, the death well, row meal? If I had to get something a little bit fancy, even though it's very simple still, it would be chicken parmesan. Okay. I love Italian food. I love a fresh tomato sauce, fresh pasta, uh, you know, a nice seared uh, little panko breading on mm-hmm. that chicken with uh, some fresh mozzarella you know, brawl that to perfection. And, you know, that's, that's really good. So what is, um, well, I would say post shift drink, but we'll say post school drink. Right. Um, just a quick beer, you know, uh, any particular brand, whatever's local, you know, 10 roof or by you test. I like their, uh, raging Cajun. Yeah. Um, I've, I've grown very fond of that, but if I had to step it up, you know, the guys over at, uh, Rank uh, Wildcat with the Sweet Crude. Mm-hmm. They have a nice little uh, aged, little dark rum. I'll just sip on that and I'm fine. Uh, what is your favorite kitchen tool? Favorite kitchen tool would be my chef's knife. And with that, yeah. I can do just about anything that needs to be done. From chopping, dicing to if I really need to open a can, I could. Um, you know, a nice little 8-inch, very sharp. Uh, I use Mercer. Um you can use a wust off, but uh, a nice little chef's knife. Gumbo, potato salad or eggs? Potato salad. See, and, and it needs to, you know, it, the yellow mustard, little mayo. Yeah. Yes, boiled egg inside, but <laughs> potato salad. Potato salad. Uh, on side note, on that, I'm just now remembering Hot Dog Stop has their hot dog of the month, and it's a gumbo one. It's a. Um, I forgot what the actual hot dog itself is made out. I want to say it's like andouille. Right. And then they have, um, it's, it's like a, a potato salad. They have like this gumbo sauce on it. And then it has like this little drizzle of potato mm. salad. I really want to try it. I'm and to see. Go try that I, I want to find unique versions of different gumbo dishes. And I, I definitely want to check that out. What is your music that you like to listen to in the kitchen? And I'll ask also if you get to listen to music while you're sure. teaching in the labs. No music while we're teaching. Oh, okay. All right. So, uh, but I like Zodico. I like Cajun music. Um, me and the five-year-old, our favorite song is by D.L. Menard, Je Passe Dona Ponana. Yeah, the back door. So uh, for me, it's, it's Cajun and Creole music. So Zodico can't go wrong. Nice. That's that's a pretty simple one. I like it. Uh, what have been some of the restaurants that you've worked in over the years? Well, I started my career off as a dishwasher at Cafe Des Amis. Okay. That's where I kind of fell in love with the kitchen. 
uh, was the very first breakfast cook at Pre Jean's right when they very they fought, they started their breakfast. I was the very first guy. I was still in high school. They gave me the key the keys to the kitchen. I was like, I'm in hog heaven. Then my first executive chef's job was um, Clementine's dining and dining experience in um, no, Liberia. Yeah, yeah. I was I, there today. Yeah, I, I learned uh, how to become a chef, and you know the roles was you know for an executive chef, and you have to wear a jack of many trades, and you know you're doing plumbing, you're doing electrical, you're doing everything. But then from there, I sw- went over to uh, Crawfish Town, USA, and while I was there. Uh, my sous chef was attending LCI, and he inspired me to go to school at LCI, where I graduated top of my class. I uh, loved it so much. I left Crawfish Town to go teach there. Um, I've helped a couple of students open up restaurants, uh, uh, various places, and and you know that's that's me in a nutshell. Was your sous chef Dusty Lachelet? Dusty, mm-hmm. Ah, look at that! It yep. is such a small world. All the the Louisiana Culinary Institute students and Zach Dewey's who mm-hmm. used to guest co well not guest but was yep. co-host of the radio show yep. went there as well. You got Mark Alamon and, and Derek Weiss over at Hook and Moyle and you got various LCI grads all over the place. I like it. Everyone went and then they're coming back and opening restaurants That's right. of their own. It's really nice. Okay, so where if people want Cajun Maypalm, right? Where can they get it? You can go to uh on Facebook, Cajun Maypalm on Facebook. You can also go to basintrading.com, and it's on there for online sales. And if you like me on Facebook, you can see at all the different events, I'll have it out. And I'm hoping in about December it will be in stores. Oh, all cool. Over so right now people can go to the events, events and purchase and, it, purchase it there. Correct. Or you can uh, send me a message on Facebook. And uh, I will meet you anywhere as I need to meet you right now. So it's kind of um, just hitting the pavement and and putting it out. And uh, it's a labor of love. You know, it's a quality product. Took me 10 years to develop. And um, I'm I'm looking forward to sharing it with everyone. Nice. And when do the festivity, when do the classes start on Saturday and Sunday for Festival of Cotillian? So it starts uh, at 1145, the first demo with me, Cajun Creole. And a noon on Sunday. Cool. Very, very cool. All right. We got about two and a half minutes left. And then the presidential debates are coming up. So we hope that we got your guys' appetites up and you're ready for the debates right. that, are, that are coming after the show. Is there a dish that you just do not want to make ever again that you're just so sick of making? Chitlins. Really? It's not that I'm sick of making it. I teach Cajun Creole, and we cook it every now and then. I just haven't had the, haven't acquired that taste. Okay, yet. so I have to say that as much as I love organ meats and eating really weird and unusual mm-hmm. things, I have never had that. So, do you cook it in a gravy, or cook is it, it in a gravy? Okay, but you have to clean it properly. And if yeah, you, don't you clean have to it be... properly, then it tastes like where it comes from. Right, right, exactly. I heard that that is. The key to it is actually clean, making sure that it's yeah. clean. I've seen it fried. Like I, I, in North Louisiana, I hear it more being fried. Yeah, I've never had it fried, but mostly in the, just in the gravy. smothered in a gravy over rice. And I may have had it in, I'm going to mispronounce this, Fraser's. Did, mm-hmm. I, did I say that correctly? Mm-hmm. Um, it, I'm, that's in there, like a, the little cowboys yeah. too. Okay, mm-hmm. so I, I have had it. But do they serve just a chitlins and, and gravy? I don't know. It's, it's you know, I know a long time ago was that little, might have been that little Sunday treat or um, I know a lot of diehard fans. Uh, we have uh, Chef Dave at school. He actually does a really good job making chitlins. Really? And his, He's a fan of them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you can't like everything. No. So, I mean, I, I get it. Is there a dish that you just love to make over and over and over again? And, and somebody's like, make this. And you're like, yes. For me, it, it's, you know, crawfish etouffee. Simple. Or sauce piquant. Something that just kind of, it's a little quick and easy etouffee or, you know, a little, a little longer for the sauce piquant. But the development of flavors is, is nice. Thank you so much for joining us tonight as guest co-host.